Hi, everyone, and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to episode six of Let's Talk ETC. I'm your host, Carlo V, along with my co-host, Dr. Christian Severino. I want to thank the ETC community for another great week. Uh, for those of you watching on YouTube, this week's ETC newsletter will be in the description below. Um, we didn't have an episode last week because uh, I had the chance to attend the Monetary Policy Meetup in London, which was awesome. And I'd really like to thank Charles and IOHK for giving me the opportunity to go out there. Also, special thanks to our panelists, Splix, uh, Snaproll, Avtar, and also Eversheds, who hosted the event. I tried to live stream while I was out there, but it didn't go so well. Um, but thankfully, Avtar had a professional team out there to film the event, and they're putting some things together right now. So that should be released pretty soon for anybody who's interested in kind of seeing uh, what happened at that event. Uh, since the last show, we had the official introduction of the Grotenbeek team. Uh, for those of you who, do, who don't know, the Grotendeek team is a new team of seven devs that IOHK uh, has committed to building a scholar client for ETC. So that's pretty cool. Um, the monetary pro policy proposal by Snaproll is still in there in the newsletter for anybody who wants to check that out. And uh, a couple other things I wanted to let everyone know about. Uh, number one, please check out ETC today. Um, we'll have that link in the description as well. It's a uh, like a online newspaper that's just really nice to read and it's got a lot of ETC info, ETC news stories, and also, also like general blockchain stories in there. So it's really good. I really recommend it to everyone uh, that I speak to lately. Um, there's also an instructional video series on mining that's been released by ePool. So anybody interested in mining that's just starting out or even if you're an experienced miner, check it out. Uh, there's also a few articles in there. Uh, including another article from Dr. Severino, uh, this one being about setting up your own ETC node. So, uh, yeah, you know, pretty cool stuff, especially the London meetup and the new team joining the project, uh, the Grotendeek team. Uh, just another reminder um, to anyone listening, everyone, I, everything I mentioned is in the newsletter, which will be in the description on YouTube. So I'm sure many of you listening out there have heard about the monetary pro policy proposal which was kind of what the entire London meetup was about, although it covered a lot of what has happened thus far, like since, since the start of Ethereum Classic and everything that's been going on. But really, most of that meetup was kind of based around the monetary policy proposal. So we have an awesome guest tonight with us. He's wicked smart, funny, nice guy too. And we got a chance to hang out a bit in London, which was awesome. Uh, the creator of the monetary pro policy proposal that everyone's been talking about, Matt Snaproll Mazer. How are you, Matt? What's going on? Thanks for coming on. Eve, evening, gentlemen. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's wicked. Um, so, uh, uh, are you from Boston? <laughs> no, no. I thought you were in New York. <laughs> yeah, New York. Right, right. Okay. Every, everybody. <laughs> Wicked's uh, Wicked's, Wicked's totally about something, right? man. Oh, you know what? I think okay. I think the Wicked rub up. The wicked rubs off on me because uh, um, I did live in Vermont for a few years, and Boston and Vermont mix mix quite a bit, you know. That's true. Yep. I, so, I think... Snaproll, I had a question for you. What? So, I've up. never had a proposal that led to an international conference, and people are flying out to uh, d discuss my proposal. How did uh, How did that make you feel? What, that is. Oh, uh, you're you're giving me way too much credit. Uh, that's. Uh, Look, there was just a need, and and I wanted to fill it. I, you know, I just th th this was something that's been talked about. I think since I mean, time frame we had right. that we had the um, what was that the Die Hard? I called it Birdie, but we had that kind of Die Hard document going around a little bit of of a minimum viable protocol and things we needed to look into, and uh, monetary yeah. policy was one of those things. Right, I, right. So I, I am an absolute spreadsheet and slide jockey. Like that's kind of my life for the most part. I know just enough Python to break anything I touch. So um, I'm not going to be coding up a whole lot, but I know that there can be a lot of analysis that can go on with monetary policy. You know, I, right. I believe in ETC at the time, hated everything that was going on, wanted to become a part of it, and I just jumped right in. So, but awesome. yeah, no, I mean, so Avatar put it all on, and he was awesome. Like it, it, it's unbelievable. I hope the community oh. recognizes that. You know, he's a huge asset. That was it was amazing to have big names in Bitcoin there. Yeah, talking about was, ETC. That was, that was pretty pretty cool. Um, just the whole the whole setup, the fact that it was where it, it was where it was, and it 
you know, it was set up the way it was set. It was, it was awesome. It really was awesome. Especially right. if you go to, you know, like an, another meetup, it, that's the, that's the, you know, most professional meetup I've ever been to, I think. Yeah. No. <laughs> so it's for, for how small and how young our, uh, you know, our little community is. That was, yeah. it's, it's, it's over the top. It was great. It was, it was wild. I'm, I'm really, uh, I really want to see the, um, the media or the, you know, the filming of the event that, that should be coming out soon. So in high def. Cause I think I was sweating on stage and I think it's, <laughs> no, in, I... it's in 4k. You'll definitely <laughs> see it. So, um, it's something that a lot, a lot of the people in the community have been asking about and stuff. They just kind of want to know, um, you know, kind of your background and how, you know, what were you doing before blockchain and kind of just how you fell down the rabbit hole, like, like most people do. <laughs> sure. Uh, how, how deep do you want me to go? Like, like uh, great. Whatever, whatever like, share, man. <laughs> okay. So it's all so you, I, I guess, uh, I'll, I guess I could do the whole college thing since we're relatively, I think crypto is kind of a young space. I mean, it's older for tech, but it's still a, a yeah. pretty young space. So Definitely. Um, I went to college uh, initially to become a pilot. And uh, I was into aviation, and um, uh, by my sophomore, year, I, like I, I just went all in, right? I, I just yeah. devoured it. So that by my sophomore year, I was actually a flight instructor, and I started teaching while I was going to school. So obviously, I'm not doing the flying program anymore. I'm going to go study something else. Right. Uh, uh, over time, you know, teaching and all that, it was really cool getting licenses, um, you know, for glider or you know, multi-engine, all that stuff. Right. There was a, a defined goal there. And then after all that got done, there wasn't really a defined goal other than to keep flying to get hired. So, um, right. you know, I was kind of looking for something else to quench that thirst. Right. There was a and um, what was that? Someone say something? No, no, sorry. That was, oh, um, okay. uh, I had some feedback, sorry. Oh, okay, no worries. So, um, yeah, so I, I just wound up with an opportunity to join a really small startup out in Oregon. Uh, doing unmanned aircraft that was in like 06 wow um, so i wound up just taking the chance you know here's the road that i know i know the path that looks beautiful being a pilot and then i just went off to the, do this wacky thing uh, and it right. turned out pretty well it, it turned out really well so there was i mean it almost doubled growth every year i was there hmm. um got bought by boeing what, now, after I, I gotta ask what was what was this unmanned pilot thing in in reference to i mean uh it's so far beyond, you know, uh, you know what I'm saying? So what, like, what was the, what was kind of the, the, the growth of it all that the unmanned pilot project? Oh, so it wasn't my project. There was like, so I was like, I don't know. I was like number 40 there. Right. I think it's at like 1200 people now. Um, so you're asking what the plane was. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Like what was their objective? Cause I, I mean, I know, what the the drones do now or what their objective is with the drones at this point in time but i'm just do trying you, to think. I, I, wow okay so i've been a market analyst tell me i have no idea what any oh. objective are with drones okay never, it's never mind it's i can already tell this is word of all time for newspapers to get readers okay never it's mind like, i guess i thought i knew but uh it's probably way beyond what um what it's supposed to be, but I, I just thought that they're looking into it, you know, for Amazon and packages and stuff like that. But so, oh god, don't even get me started on Amazon. Amazon, <laughs> Amazon only advertises its drone systems around Thanksgiving, Black Friday, and around Christmas. Right. So that's that's you all like a marketing ploy, I guess. That's as far as I can tell. Like I've okay. been saying that since 2014. They're 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 working on it. I have a friend who you know works up there, but when you consider regulations. Right. Are, are really stringent on this stuff. I mean, you got stuff in the sky that's just flying over people's houses. And then two, when you consider the business case for how to get a drone into like a city to drop off toilet paper at someone's house, that ain't <laughs> yes. happening. So you're going to yeah. have to go into the rural areas. And what's that right. market size? It's not that that's big. True. So then why would you put all of this money into a robotic flying machine in order to go give a farmer something? Very There's true. like 20 of them for 100 miles. Okay. I'm back with you now. I have no idea what they're doing. So um, it's, 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 it's all right. like predator drones then. Uh, so, yeah, no. So uh, mine was uh, defense. It was defense uh, use is what it was. Okay. That was kind of what I was trying to. Uh, right. Was so confused. it was they were used for, there weren't any weapons or anything. It was intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance. So ISR. Uh, okay. Cool. So it was a small 40 pound aircraft that, you know, stayed in the air for about 24 hours at a time. So it was used a lot in like Afghanistan, Iraq, and all those guys. Mm. 
Okay, so yeah, sorry um, I uh, I derailed the convo there. Okay, yeah. so you got into um, the defense and drones and stuff. Keep going, sorry. Dude, dude, that is my wheelhouse, okay? You bring me into the into this uh, AK drone space, I'll, I'll talk your ear off. So I'll try to lay off of that. <laughs> but, um, uh, but yeah, yeah so, go ahead. so I was there since about 06. Uh, Boeing bought the company in like 08, 09. And so I started working a lot more with Boeing. Um, I wound up doing strategy, M&A, and um, doing stuff with a, a lot of like the R&D guys who are trying to get funding for their own internal projects. So basically taking super tech speak, spending a lot of time with those guys, and then turning into like executive speak slides and everything like that. So, you know, we can, people can have a conversation that are using completely different languages. Right. It's like right? the, uh, the, 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 tr the translators that people don't know are translators. Yeah, exactly. So, Can you define so what like you mean by M&A? Yeah, that. so mer mergers and acquisitions. Oh, I see. Okay. Or if you're an American psycho, it'd be I'm, I was murder, just thinking murders, murders and, and executions. Executions, I swear. <laughs> you just read my mind. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I didn't have a really nice uh, bone-colored yeah. um, uh, business card or anything like that. No, but did you, uh, but did you like crossword puzzles? <laughs> no, I didn't, but I do have to return some videotapes. I do have to this. return some videotapes. After this, I might have to leave early. So um, anyways, uh, yeah, so I got into that and um, was doing that for a number of years. Again, 2013, 2014, 2015, it was just pandemonium. Everyone's like, oh, commercial stuff is going to be, it's going to be everywhere. The skies are going to be blacked out with just <laughs> drones flying all over the place. And I'm just like, I don't see the model. I don't know what you guys are looking at. But I will tell you guys this, 2015, check out this Bitcoin deal, right? I kind of looked into it in 20, I think right. I saw, I remember Slashdot in 2011. And I pulled the same crap that everyone else has done where you ignore it until you read about it five or six times. Mm -hmm. And then maybe like a price jump happens and you really look into it. And then right. when you look into it, your hair blows back. Like you're in an F-15 going Mach 2 and then the, 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 the dome <laughs> just blows off randomly and you've just got all this air right in front of your face and just sets you back. Oh my God, what am I looking at type thing? Yeah, right? pretty much. So the, uh, yeah, it was funny. Everyone, you know, my background is, is in drones and I, kind of just abandoned that. I don't want to say abandoned it. I'm still doing consulting. That's kind of what I'm doing right now, consulting with people who are looking to use these for particular cases in the commercial space. Right. Um, so mostly my job is saying, well, just put it on a 200 foot stick and put a gimbaled camera up there and you can do exactly what you're asking to, what you're wanting to do with the drone without the worry that it's going to go fly off. Uh, and it only costs like one fifth of the price. Mm. So right. uh, anyways, uh, yeah, so so that's did all that stuff. Moved out to Colorado for a girl. Don't ever do that. Uh, <laughs> never ever. Which, don't Unless don't do what the, the Colorado part there. or the girl part. No, the Colorado part is great. Yeah, I was don't do say. it for the girl part. That was oh man. And okay, that was great. It was great for six months, but yeah. Right. Um, so but so yeah. The, so that's kind of where we're does at. Does the Colorado part balance out the girl part? Like the Colorado being the good decision and the girl being the bad decision, you mix them both together <laughs> and you get an okay so, decision. Colorado is pretty good. Keep in mind that I was up in Oregon. So I was near Portland. That's probably the weirdest place in the country in the U S that exists. So mm -hmm. while people talk about hippies out in Boulder, it's nothing compared to like, I'm almost bored by those hippies compared to just the insanity that exists in the, the city in, in around the city of Portland. Yeah. So. I, I went there a few times when I was like, uh, what was I like 13, 14, 15. I mean, if you know something is actually out of the norm in the adult world, when you're 13, it must be a weird place. <laughs> yeah. So like, the thing is, is if you're, if you're there by the time you're 30, you can't leave. You <laughs> like, cause the reality is not exactly what you've grown up around. And you, I don't think it's almost like being in jail for 50 years where you come out, you know, like red was here from the, yeah, yeah, it was just, it's like an institutional man. Yeah. yeah. You can't do guys. You can't literally get paid for sitting outside and playing a guitar and someone's not going to give you a sandwich, like at the restaurant, like just some random bard is rolling around looking for food. They just go into restaurants and then somehow they, they play to eat. You know, it's just, it's, there's some wacky stuff. I don't know, but the reality is just not the same anywhere else in the world. So, so did you make money investing in Bitcoin or what was your interest or how did you pursue that interest? So um, I, I said it at the, um, 
uh, during my presentation, I made the point that, um, so I, I, you know, like I said, uh, slash dot 2011, I totally re remember that, ignored it. 2013 came around, pretty interesting. One of my software developer friends, um, you know, he works on some of the systems that we were working on. He goes, you seen Bitcoin? I'm like, no, is that thing still real? Is that what's going on? And he goes, yeah, oh my God, come check it out. It's like, oh okay, Jesus. All right, let's go look, right? And then we'll do Dungeons and Dragons later. Um, right. So, so um, uh, yeah, I looked at it then, got into it, uh, just playing around with it a little bit, not going too crazy. Uh, and then you had that spike that happened in November and it was just like, oh, this can't, this guy, I've seen these charts before. Mm -hmm. This isn't good. So, you know, played around with that, but, but spent a lot of time. I, I think Andrea said something where he spent like three months just obsessing over Andreas had instant yeah. office. He spent like three months obsessing over it when he first learned it. I, I have a hard time believing that most people haven't gone through that. I, I, right. I so, think, so yeah. I went through that for like a month where I was like, that's it. I'm just, I'm not getting any sleep. It was, <laughs> it was harsh times. So, so that was interesting. And then, so 2014, it was scam city, right? And I'm really interested in this stuff and I want to start playing around with it, but I don't know what's real and what's fake anymore. So it was kind of a just spray and pray type deal or just throw a little bit into a couple of things, see what happens, right? You know, Bitcoin looks, it's legit, but there's all this other talk going on all over the place. So, right. you know, throw a Bitcoin into this weird wacky thing with that's on Bitcoin talk with some people talking about it. 2000 ETH, whatever this stuff is for a Bitcoin. Yeah, okay, fine. We'll just throw one out there. Right. See what happens. And then, you know, that you throw money into something, you tend to learn about it a lot more. Mm -hmm. That was actually my thinking on some of these things. So, so that's kind of how I got into it. It's just a whim spray and pray. Let's see what's going on. And then look into it after you throw the money into it and see how much right. you lost. As a, res as a result of having a stake, you end up learning a ton. Right. Pay it paying for your education. Yeah. Right. right. <laughs> or, or sometimes getting paid for your education. Yeah. And, and, oh. Yeah. yeah. And one in 10,000, times that that happens yes correct and, yeah and so how did you then make the leap from bitcoin to ethereum and then ethereum classic so like i said the ethereum thing was interesting to me after i had just you know thrown a coin in there for the heck of it uh -huh. right just to just to interest me to become more interested into it and so you get into it and you start looking it's okay there's some interesting stuff here this is they, they got some this is low level programming capabilities here right so i always view it as kind of Bitcoin's kind of like a spreadsheet where you can do basic arithmetic as well as hand input stuff. Mm -hmm. It seemed to me how I kind of explained it is Ethereum is uh, sort of like a spreadsheet, but with you can do your formulas. Mm -hmm. right? you, can do add, you can do your, uh, your sum ifs and your V lookups and all, you know, all that, your index match, all that sort of right. stuff. So it adds a little bit more capability to that spreadsheet. And so, okay, this looks interesting. Let's stick with it. And then kind of ignored it for the most part of 2015. Uh, 2016 started getting, you know, looking at it more. Um, and then and that, really that, Dow, that Dow thing happened and, and people started saying fork. And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> are you kidding me? So I didn't have any part of the Dow. That advertising was completely insane. Um, I don't know how people threw, threw money into that thing, looking at that yeah, advertising. I thought that was strange too. So, um, but yeah, when they... Uh, uh, I, th I thought classic wouldn't survive, right? I just, it just seemed like it was just overpowering the PR political propaganda machine has just overrun this thing. Either I'm way, getting, I'm getting out of ETH. I'm getting out of anything associated <laughs> with this. And then you see like these guys playing around with this Ethereum classic thing. It's like, okay, whatever. I mean, I, I love, I love the effort guys, but you're up <laughs> against a huge wall. So money and interest, what, I, so what I hear you saying is, is the, the, the forked Ethereum was kind of like the Hillary Clinton with so much <laughs> exactly. money that right. it couldn't possibly lose. Yeah. But, but, um, but classic was like the Jeb Bush, right? Didn't forget <laughs> Like you just know, you're not getting anywhere like the Rubio or something. You're like, it, that's how I initially looked at it. Three days in, you start going on Bitcoin talk and you see, uh, you know, a whole bunch of people talking about it. And then, you see people on the Reddit, you're like, you know, I'm sitting there going, all right, uh, you know what? I'm in. I want to, let's, let's do this. Yeah. There's no it, possible, there's no business case for ETH. It, so it, it so did look, maybe this has it did a look, shot. Uh, it looked bleak when it went from, I remember it opened and when it first opened in Poloniex, 
I was like, oh man, it's happening. And then it went from like 95 cents to 35 cents instantaneously, like really fast. I was like, okay, maybe this is not happening. Right. But, yeah, but then, I, it, then, it, then it happened. I was there. I didn't have anything. I think that was a Saturday night. So at the risk of letting everyone know that I wasn't doing anything on a Saturday. Go for um, it, man. Yeah, right. So there's my interesting life. <laughs> We're um, in blockchain. Right. So, <laughs> this is interesting. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I was sitting there looking. I was just kind of on the Reddit, checking it out. And um, all of a sudden, someone announces somewhere, hey, it's on Poloniex. <laughs> okay, wow, this is, what the heck is going on? This is insanity. And then, obviously, we know the next five days or the next week was just crazy. Yeah. <laughs> right? So, I, so one of the things I say is, and then, you know, leading up, the whole DAO thing was just, there's so much drama. It was just crazy. Like, blockchain is nuts. When you come from my background where it's aerospace and everything is cut there's processes all over the place for everything yeah there's regulation all over the place for everything and you come to this wild west it's like man i came for the technology but i i'm staying for the drama (laughs) it is so thick you can pour it on your pancakes man it is unbelievable the drama in this space i remember uh I remember when I was at Coin Agenda, and there was someone that was from like a standard like stock investment play, like space, and they just couldn't right. believe like the volatility that people deal with. Like, like, like a down, it's insane. Down seven percent day is like a sideways movement. That's yeah, it's nothing. That's boy, seven percent's not. That's an expectation. Yeah, <laughs> right. Movement of seven percent. That's an expectation. Yeah, like. So. And uh, it was yeah. just, it was just funny seeing them like kind of start to to get into it. it it's uh, just funny. I don't know. Now, one thing that on. was, speaking of funny stories, one thing I read was um, so, so was a, a good Samaritan was trying to send a, a, a message to Vitalik, who apparently, if I remember correctly, had was doing a demo somewhere, and he just casually moved almost a million dollars worth of. of e- oh yeah, and, it was and, real. Somebody say, wait, wait, hold on, guys. Let's remember that the stuff has monetary value, and people in the real world will do nasty things to uh, take money from people. So <laughs> yeah, that was that was. So. Confer- I think that was confirmed real as well. Um, oh man, yeah. yeah, that was pretty wild. Um, by the way, did either of you guys ever get a chance to read before the fork happened? There was a post on the Ethereum Reddit, and I think it was titled Two Chains," and this guy laid it all down perfectly exactly from like a game theory analysis whatever you want to call it exactly how everything would go down and how there would be two chains um, huh. if you guys haven't read it uh, i'll send it to you after after the show it's so it's over really... how long over how long a period of time though no he just broke it down and he said you know there's going to be the second chain okay and once there's the second chain there's going to be someone mining and getting all the transactions and then they're gonna gotcha there's going to be, but you know, over the counter trades, and then once there's over the counter trades, so some exchange is going to want a piece, and once yep. you have the exchange, and it's just going to balloon from there. Oh, and man. yeah, he, he laid it all out pretty good. It was, it was a really good post. Interesting. Yeah, we made some money on his predictions. Then. Okay, nobody so, ever makes money on the predictions. That's not how this <laughs> game works. All right. <laughs> <laughs> this game does exactly what you're not predicting. <laughs> Right. What 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 he most likely did was uh, he made that post, then made a post completely contradicting it, and then deleted that one. Uh, well, no, I, I don't know. Um, so, uh, so okay. So so you're on the uh, so etc starts to happen. You get involved. Okay, keep going. Sorry, we derailed. You know, so I, I saw there was a bunch of stuff going on, and it, all it occurred to me was, okay, cool, more chaos. I love this. This is so much fun. So um, it was more along the lines of, I, I don't believe that there is any mastermind behind this. I think this is a straight up community effort and I'm going to act accordingly. So I just yeah. started, I just started doing stuff, right? I, I just kind right. of entrepreneurial, wild west, here's some opportunity, let's do stuff. This is, this is really fun. I guess it started out as sort of fun you know, for the first day or two because nobody knew this thing was going to take off the way it was, I don't think. Um, right. I, I just, I don't know, I'm trying to figure out how to describe you it. Kind it's, of, you it's, kind it's, of just it's, just, it's just looking for stuff to do to help out the network. To, and then here's my skill set. 
let's try to find a try to find something to help out with given the skill set and then just jumping in once you find something yeah 100 percent. right yeah just kind of you just you you know the, the snowball starts to roll and you start to do this that and the other thing you're doing one thing then you end up doing two then you end up doing four sure um, yeah, yeah exactly. I, I know what you mean. well so what was great is like yeah once you do start yeah you, the snowball that's a very good very good example um because yeah it, that's i guess kind of how it happened i didn't expect to be doing any of the stuff that i'm doing here i'm just i'm just trying to truck forward and and doing you know, trying to trying to help out etc yeah, i know you, you uh, stayed for the drama you end up in london giving a proposal <laughs> in front of like it in the what the city state of london or whatever it's called right in, yeah, the city it never sheds it's, to, it's not a city it's not a city state but it's definitely no, a city within the city it's got its own like yeah, legal code the, and stuff. Yeah, it's not the city state. It's called the city of London, and it has the Lord Governor Mayor of London. You know, some really British yeah. sounding title. Yeah, <laughs> Lord Mayor. So, so Snapperl, I had a question for you. Um, is so, uh, uh, of course, appreciate your your proposal. But did you just do you have an economics <laughs> mind, or how did you come to 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 think that about the the, the subject that you proposed? Uh, so it was kind of a hobby of mine, understanding economics. I guess when I started doing work full time out of college, I just worked all the time. I mean, that's uh, I had a pillow underneath my desk. So um, after yeah. a couple months of that, I basically sat there and go, "What is this I'm doing? And what like what am I chasing after?" It turns out it's this little piece of paper. Like what what am I? What is this thing? Right. So just as a hobby, I started reading into money. Um, uh, doing economics, that sort of stuff, reading the economics. Um, and just, I guess, knowledge over time just builds on itself and mm -hmm. you kind of understand what's going on. And then, you know, you see, you read some of the forum posts from like back in the day, 2010 on Bitcoin talk. You guys talk about the, the economics of Bitcoin. Um, you know, people worrying about, oh, it's only got a cap. It'll be deflationary. No, here's why. And then they'll have some links to Austrian economic schools of thought you click on those and you read it. So you just, you just accumulate this knowledge on this sort of thing, mm -hmm. right? By being around it. Uh, so no, my, my background, I, I'm not an economics major at all. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but um, it's figuring funny. Out, uh, figuring out this information and figuring out how to apply this information. I, I have a number of years of kind of doing that with my background in, in aerospace and drones. It, we had disruptive business models there. Um, that's why I was so successful, the company that I was working for. So just having mentors there that, that taught me how to think. Here's some disruptive ways to think. Um, here's ways to think about just, I don't know, everyday things just slightly differently than what you may have been taught. And so somehow you got the bee in your bonnet that you wanted to, you thought the cap was a good idea. You thought the the inflationary current model was could be corrected it could be improved and so somehow that idea just got in your head and you wanted to help out well so the reality is that ETH had this plan to have some sort of cap i think since the beginning right i don't know what the number is it could be 100 million it could be something like that so when when you see something that just goes on forever it's really tough to sit there and go how, how do you bootstrap this thing Right? Yeah. The price is just going to stay down because there's just all these coins coming out. Sure, we can have more utility, but um, that, that's going to be tough when people are sitting there looking for the security to put their utility on. So the, the reduced rate of what Bitcoin has is just an extremely good model for doing that sort of thing. You know, rewarding yeah, the speculators early on who are just throwing money at, at, at something that's really high risk. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a fertile, you know, it, it provides the fertile ground to get the ball rolling at least, you know. Right, so I don't know of a better model than that. I don't know of a better model than the, 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 the depreciating inflation over time that, that can do what we're looking to do and what needs to be done to bootstrap a, a cryptocurrency. Yeah. Okay, so, but is just to play devil's advocate, so the, the flip side, let me see if I could think. So the in the long term because it's deflationary you're rewarding the people that took the risk early on but hypothetically could that uh, discourage new people way down the line from getting involved if the you see what i'm saying because sure absolutely no it and you're right it could um so that's that's a big issue that 
I was talking to people about, you know, months ago, we were talking about, you know, Burns, he loves to have the inflation thing, but I, I yell at Burns, but I love Burns because if it yeah. wasn't for Don't Panic Burns, I probably wouldn't have come to some of the conclusions that I've come to, right? So at least he held it back rather than pushing all this inflation Okay, well, can, you, yeah. can you elaborate? That's interesting. So you, yeah. you, so, you, proved, you evolved your So ideas. let's look at it this way. Let me, I'm, I'm thinking on the fly here, so bear with me. But um, to your point, will it drive future users and speculators away who might be trying to find like a store of value for this thing? Potentially, yes. Okay. Now, does it increase or decrease if you shove more supply closer to now, closer to the start, than spreading it out over time. Okay. That that so if 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 people are looking at a currency and they see the Bitcoin's model, and then they see another model, which instead of 50% reduction every four years, it's 72 million pre-mine, and then it's gonna max at a hundred, mm -hmm. right? Where is the likely long-term view or the people who come in late? where do they think the opportunity still lies? And I'd argue that it's on something like a Bitcoin model, which still has an inflationary, um, you know, it still has production over the long term. So the, the, uh, the total number of tokens hasn't been super centralized by people who got in there extremely early. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Right. Right, so also, if you were gonna do Bitcoin model in one-tenth the time, I think that would drive a lot of people away from investing in the currency uh, or the crypto, I don't, I don't know if I want to call them currencies, you know, on the token. Um, um, let's see, let's try to figure out what I was just saying. If, if you push Bitcoin's model 10 times sooner, right? People who didn't hear about it soon enough may be skeptical of investing in it because of that centralization of the token ownership. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah especially right, so with, yeah, I was gonna say, um, and then the, the double whammy with that is the centralization and the move to proof of stake as well. Sure. Yeah. We're, um, we're money talks, you know, right? Whoever's got the most exactly. is going to be in control. So you, you can, you can, I was going to say, you could maybe make some sort of, you know, argument that, oh, if it's centralized and then you, they stay proof of work, eventually the funds get dispersed and stuff like that. But when you're doing the double whammy of the huge pre mine and a hundred million cap with 72 million gone, plus proof of stake, it's like, you know, one, two, three punch knockout. Right. Potentially. So Christian, to your point, uh, just a little bit further. So the question is, is, is where is the right, what is fair, mm -hmm. right? What is the right distribution? The right amount? Balance. And yeah. we can have, you can have, you can come up with a million different models and you're always going to find someone or a group or a lot of people who will be for it or against it for whatever reason, because they might see it as unfair. What I do know is that Bitcoin is well known by anybody that's in the crypto space. They know exactly what the distribution rate is and nobody really has a problem with it. So that's why I looked at ETC and I said, look, we can avoid all of these conversations, all of these arguments, um, all of these people in the future or now claiming that, oh, this is a scam. They, they put too many coins too soon or, oh, it's too late. Like they're not doing it fast enough. Like, look, here's the model that works. Mm -hmm. Let's try to, to mirror this as much as we can. Sure. I mean, that's a good argument. There's, there's evidence for the Bitcoin model, whereas there's not evidence for, uh, or too much evidence for other types of right. diverging models. Sure. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a pretty uh, pragmatic approach for sure. Uh, that's why, yeah, you know, we can come up with all the theory in the world, but it, it, it's 10 times more valuable if you can find something in practice that works and just kind of copy that. Yeah. And it also helps making the case. You say, well, look, here's Bitcoin and it's working great. Okay. What's, what's your argument for, for your side? And then they, right. What, what can they say? That's right. Well, so, the, so the other point is I look at, uh, we kind of want to boot the bootstrap the system now, right. In the short term. So the other thing to this point is that, Imagine if we did something a lot sooner where we just did a hundred million and it, it stops next year, right? It's all done okay. and whoever's in now. So I would argue that over the next three years, you'd have more optimum. So it was, I'm looking for optimum total investment. Mm 
And so I think if you can do the right monetary policy where everybody can sort of agree that it's not bad, it's not, you know, they can't come up with too many arguments one way or the other, you'll get optimum investment. And so that model will actually produce more investment in the short term than another model that's strictly going after um, rewarding people short term. Mm -hmm. So I would argue that something like a Bitcoin model, which everyone understands, it's easy to understand, gets recognized as the fair model. Mm -hmm. I think there will be more investment by people on the outside looking in because they recognize it as opposed to a model which is specifically designed to try to jack up early investment. Mm -hmm. Right. Pushing everything to like a hundred million within the next six months. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Cause they're going to sit there and go scam. I'm not touching it. I don't know who owns this stuff. I, I can't play a big part in it. I can't ride this thing. Okay. So, so my, so the argument is that the model that in ECIP 1017 is that this is going to help with optimal investment, which will help on, which will be better than almost any other model, no matter the time frame. Right. What's, what's it's long better, term, mid term, or short term? Right. What's What's better for the network is not small pie now. It's what it's just a bigger pie in general. Right. Well, even if you're trying to get your 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 share of the pie, right? So yeah. people, the argument that people have been giving me is, you know, I, they want to increase their share of the pie. They want to have as much as possible right now. So I argue that when you and here's some weird strategy theory, but um, you have a pie of total value of X or whatever, right? So um, if you have a share of like 10% of that, most people, what they do, and this is kind of life in general, is that they try to double that share. They try to go from 10% to 20%. When the reality is, is that they would have more total pie if they worked on putting their efforts towards doubling the size of the pie. Mm -hmm. So double the degrees is far less than X squared. Mm -hmm. Right, okay, right. So, that, so that's what I'm looking at here is how can we expand this pie to incorporate as many people as possible so that the pie expands, forget right. the shares. Expand right. the pie and we're all better off. Sure. The network is, is the important thing, not, not the... Exactly. You know, yeah. to, to, and I think, I think we've seen like a ton of interest, especially um, in China and stuff. You know, the trading volumes are always massive over there. Um, and they're just they're pretty interested in what's going on with ETC. Um, pretty much, you know, since not since I don't, I don't know about since the start, but pretty early on, China has been really interested in what's going on. And actually, um, it looks like there's going to be a, another, you know, big meetup or a big conference over there, uh, in mid January, uh, no details exactly on that yet, but yeah, it you looks like that that's one? shaping up. Yeah. Are you, what's are going you, on? Are you heading up the efforts on that at all or? Um, yeah, yeah, I'm working on that with some people. Nothing's, um, you know, set in stone or anything like that. But as soon as I have details, I'm going to be, you know, getting them out to everybody and letting everybody know. So that's pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah I had cool. a question. Uh, before before we, we end our show, I wanted to make sure to, to ask you this. Is there some, what's like the most common misunderstanding or uh, issue that you that people need, need, to, need you to clarify or... <laughs> That, what would you what would you like your your message to if you what do you want to get out for this show the biggest kind of thing you could help to tell people um let me try to pull up my computer here and i was going to look at my slides and see what some of the arguments are um you can kind of look at the slides i threw them on our slack channel i can upload them again um but there was a there was a few arguments that were interesting there one was um have a lower ETC amount. So I think the ECIP proposal, it's between 205 and 215 million given uncle rates over time. I think it'll wind up closer to 210 than anything. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, the, the, basically the bounds will be somewhere between 200 and 210, I figure. Okay. Uh, by, by block 5 million. So, um, So there wasn't a, a question that kept coming up at the London meeting or that there wasn't any massive source of confusion that comes to mind. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think of one. Well, there was, um, there was, um, um, there was uh, someone named, I forgot his last name, but his name's Jess. Or oh, Jez, yeah, that's right. And, right. And he brought up, uh, you know, and he, he was, he was pretty respectful. He had questions. Um, there was, I'm glad uh, he brought it up. yeah, yeah. I, I, I think we, um, try to avoid kind of that echo chamber mentality 
that yeah. can happen in other communities. So I'm glad, you know, Avatar gave him the stage to ask his questions and gave also people, you know, myself included, a chance to respond. And I, I think Avatar, I saw, even gave him an opportunity um, uh, post-interview for him to speak his views. Um, but then there was another thing. I think there was a lot of negativity on uh, Reddit and Slack, um, kind of just people trying to trying to rip him apart just for asking some questions. So, uh, for well, anybody so, listening, so his question was that he wanted innovation, right? We're sitting here talking right. about monetary policy. We're talking about, you know, Sp Splits went up there and did a, a pretty good presentation about what the status is of everything and some of the stuff he wants to do on core yeah. and uh, some of that stuff. So, what? It was Jez? Is that what his name was? Yeah, I so, believe so. So Jez says, "Hey, you guys are doing all this stuff. I want the innovation. Give me the innovation." Like ETH, ETH sees nothing. Well, so if you look in and you talk to Splix enough and you see all the work that he's doing, thank God that guy already shaves his head because he would have lost his hair by now. <laughs> okay, so that's one thing. Um, so, like in aviation, so aerospace, I'm finding a lot of parallels between this technology and the stuff, the, the way we that has been done in aerospace and that is at least in aerospace it is stability and reliability are paramount if you don't yeah. have those two things i don't care how efficient your aircraft is it just does not matter okay yeah and so eth has been going through all this crap over the last four months right and splix is sitting there working to try to stabilize this thing and make it useful you talk to him more you start looking at the code that he's doing and you go man this yeah. is some of this stuff is jumbled right some of this I, it doesn't this is not well processed yeah, work. I, I had a I had Elaine on and uh she mentioned she was like Splix is a tank. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to have him on by the way, but uh that's for another day. But yeah, she said like he's he's a machine, so that's awesome. Yeah, so thank God, you know, he's doing his thing. And he's and he's got the right mindset on that. And that's why I, I think you guys initially knew that I I was pushing for like a three million block um monetary policy, but talking to him, seeing the stuff that was going on. Uh, yeah, what, what he was handling. It's like, I am not putting this on top because I do not want this thing to be, you know, trying to, like, yeah, rushed exactly. Or what, what do people say? Um, uh, move fast, break things. Right. Right. Not that sort of thing. Have this no. stability because it, it's all a trust issue. Right. right. And our goal right. should be not, to not have trust. Our goal should be trustless. Yes. Also a lot, right? a lot of people I've spoke with, you know, anecdotally, nothing, you know, uh, nothing in, in, quotes or anything like that but a lot of the investors and stuff that i spoke with they're like listen we understand you know wanting to get it right and not wanting to rush it as long as stuff is in writing and it seems not seems but that the community is committed to doing x y and z on such by such and such date you know we're okay with that so it's right. not like it's not like the investors that were interested in etc are like okay do it do it next week you got to do it now you got to do it now um, so a lot of them are, are here and with ETC because they want that uh, the opposite of the move fast break things mentality. So they're okay with us, you know, doing things diligently and you know methodically. Right. So so I argue that the that Jazz will see the innovation once the security rises up sufficiently and once uh -huh. the platform is more stabilized. Because if I was a developer, I, I would be doing I'd be I'd be playing around with stuff. Right? I'd be right. playing on the system, but I wouldn't be doing anything serious just because I don't know what's going on. Right? Yeah. Maybe we might see some big stuff in just you know, a few months. Not, I would say you know, months, three months. I don't know. Maybe there's people working on it right now that are just waiting to just flip the switch. Right, right. Okay? But you can kind of make the case that Goldman Sachs is not going to throw anything on this network right now. Okay? Right. Not that we want them to, but I'm just saying no one's going to touch it in, in, at, at that massive level. Uh, until the stability and reliability is absolutely there, unquestionable, mm -hmm. and until the, the hash rate is higher. So, so what I wanted to say to Jez also was, um, you know, he's worried about the innovation and all that. Well, let's get the thing working first, and you'll probably see it. But, but two, I wanted to say innovation, what you're seeing that in ETH. Like, so I still have this question outstanding. I have it on my Twitter and stuff. So I pinned it. But I don't know what the business case is for ETH anymore. I don't know what a business case is for a transaction reversing decentralized blockchain. Mm -hmm. So yeah. distributed ledger makes way more sense, far more efficient, far faster, far cheaper to operate. Just do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, it was uh, it's a strain that was their whole value proposition. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> that kind of kind of went out the window there. I, I guess that's why we are where we are. Yep. Um, the other the other thing that I wanted to to point out to Jez, but I, I didn't not sure I got the opportunity or not just because this even happened inside our own Slack community. Um, you know, when people would be working on say something, uh, you know, marketing related or someone would be working on something monetary policy related. Uh, I remember even when, when we were talking about this, uh, you know, a couple months back, you were like, Oh no, we need to focus on, we need to you know do this, that, and the other thing for dev, dev, dev. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm, I'm not dev. I don't know how to code. So everyone's going to do what they're inclined to do on an open source project. And that's kind of how a whole bunch of stuff gets done. Um, mm -hmm. So people who are inclined to work on the economics of the project will people who are inclined to develop will develop people who are into, you know, getting the word out there about the project. will do that. You know, it's not like everyone has to do this one specific thing, one thing at a time. That's just kind of inefficient in general. Right. And so, so I think, you know, maybe some people want to think, well, you know, I'll never be known for the work that I do if I do anything like that. Well, if you do it good, it almost doesn't matter what you're doing. People will recognize it. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you can't code, if you can't slave away at a spreadsheet like me, right. Find something. And I'm, I'm pretty sure, no, I'm certain if you do a good job at it, it will be recognized. You will become famous. It's fine. Right. Like it's going, it will happen. Mm -hmm. so yeah so i'm with you with that one caveat like you don't guys you don't have to code right you don't have to be awesome at math figure out some way to add value to the network and it's it's almost a certainty that you're rewarded mm -hmm. and Agreed. almost that, and well that's i mean that goes for anything in life really like if you yeah. just if you go all in it doesn't matter what it is mm -hmm. right you so, will at some point get recognized so uh with the exception of this person that had his questions have you had a lot of other pushback to the monetary policy that you're proposing not really you know i've talked to roy a lot he gave me some uh, feedback okay um but i i put that feedback in the slides or some yeah. of that feedback in the slides now i'm, and, a, uh, I'm a big fan too bad. Oh, sorry i didn't mean but, to so, so yeah i i haven't heard too much um, crazy. I, and I've tried to leave the door open for people to contact me on it. But um, like I said, I haven't really heard too much. Okay. Now i just wanted to make one comment. I'm a big fan of counting uh, my blessings and it could have, uh, it, it, this could have played out in a parallel universe a lot differently that it could have been, you know, a really big brawl with different opinions on the monetary policy. And, and it's just, I'm just glad that it's not that way that, it's it's not that controversial and there's not this big fight but right. uh, that that's something on my mind and that's something other people are talking about is how to resolve uh more contentious issues in the future but uh, so i'm just glad that this is one of those. so if if you look back at um that die hard document I, I made a point that monetary policy were probably the most contentious issue that we have at least in the near term mm -hmm. and that we probably won't be able to get rid of all of it all the contention, but at least we can mitigate that by communication, by making a solid, you know, um, yeah, making the information, the case for it to be, to be solid. You can't pull any punches. You can't like try to sneak anything in there. Right. Mm -hmm. If we come up with the best policy, I think, and we can explain it well, then people will understand it, see it and be willing to go with it. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. But if you try to start playing games where you're trying to, maybe we can, maybe we can sneak in some extra ether or some extra ETC early. Right? right, people. Someone's gonna cry foul. Yeah. Right. Right. So if you just try to do the best thing, then I, I think what would play out, and and if you communicate it well, that's like I said, super important. If you can do those two things, then you can kind of mitigate, not all of it, but a good amount. Yes, and give people a chance to voice their concerns and their gripes. So Absolutely. It doesn't blow up into you know the the worst case scenario. Of course, would be it blows up into another fork. Uh, yeah. So. <laughs> Yep. Right, so. exactly. I mean, so if someone comes up with a better monetary policy than mine, if you want to go with it, mm -hmm. I'm fine. Mm -hmm. Right. If you guys want to go work for it, go for it because I'm, I'm for what's good for ETC. My ego is way out of this. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, it's, it's not a personal shot at me. If, if something else gets adopted, that's great. I'm all for it. Yeah. Yep. Mer so, merit, merit based. Everything is the way to go for sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, um so go ahead. Oh, also, I was going to say, uh, also, you mentioned kind of uh, uh, your initial rabbit hole trip, I guess, 
was was kind of with a lot of people with Austrian economics and you know libertarian principles and stuff like that. So um, I just wanted to kind of ask you more about that and your your views as far as you know because I, I think one of the major something they brought up I remember I, I don't remember I think it was his name is Aaron or something about the difference between you know how gold is actually inflationary because they keep finding it and stuff like that but it, my thing is that if you can have a known number it just it, businesses always like to have an investors like if they can know something and have it planned out better they'll take it so sure I just sure. wanted to know your opinion on that no I I agree with you I what cryptocurrency Bitcoin all that sort of stuff but I th it might be the first thing in mankind, you know, in the history of mankind or the history of Earth, where there is a known quantity and there is a yeah. known distribution rate, and it is a hundred percent accurate. Right. Right. I, I, like so I, can't, I, I, get I can't what think he, of anything else that's like that. Yeah, I, I get what he was saying about how, you know, if the inflation number is known, then that's all that matters. But at the same time, if you can improve on what gold is, not just by making it, uh, you know, digital, but if you can also improve on it by knowing the actual total quantity and giving people another reference point of certainty, wh why not do it? Uh, that's just kind of my personal feeling. Sure. I mean, if, if that could happen with gold, that'd be great. But yeah, surprises I know. Are, the human condition is the fact that surprises are always fun, but they make bad business, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, so. I, I, I think so. Oh, that's what, because we, we started getting into this at, um, when we were eating, you know, dinner that one night after we walked uh, for 10 miles, which is pretty funny. Oh, um, that was only 10 miles. So, so one of the things is, so Splix, by the way, I, you know, I met him up on Monday. Oh yeah. Um, please. Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, he, he got back to me when he went back um, to Russia and he said, look, we average 24 kilometers a day walking. And so neither, he was in like snow boots and I was in like some Mark Echo shoes. So they weren't, they, neither of these were walking shoes. And we walked, I think that's 15 miles, 24 kilometers, about 15 miles. So that's 45 miles over three days. I think I lost about three or four pounds <laughs> just hanging out with that guy in London. So what, uh, what do you do with uh, Splix in London? Oh, you want, okay. You want that story. Oh yeah. So the great, uh, Splix is a great guy, right? So uh, not only is he really good, at, at what he's doing, um, you know, he's, he's good at programming. He's good at what I like more about his ability to program is the fact that he's a very stable hand, right? He's a stable guy, can think this stuff through, and won't really be influenced by people freaking out around him. Okay? Yeah. He can he can maintain focus, but um, but yeah. So I never met him before. He never met me before. We're staying at the same hotel in London. Um, he goes, hey, I get in 11. I probably can't check until 2. Let's go get a coffee. Okay, sounds good. So 11 comes around. He uh, calls up my room. I come on down. Uh, I meet him. And then uh, you know, he goes back up to put his luggage up or whatever it was. And um, I go, man, I'm, I'm freezing. Right? So I have my scarf. I've got like three shirts on and I've got my overcoat. Um, I'm from Florida. That's where I grew up. So so I'm, I'm cold. This may be... 25 degrees or something outside 20 degrees um, Fahrenheit uh, so Splix goes man I'm it's so hot here this is crazy <laughs> so he's like just walking around in a sweatshirt and it's just yeah. like oh god here we go with this day here we go let's go get some coffee all right so um, we walked around went towards Big Ben through Hyde Park Big Ben walked you know just kind of saw some of the weird sites that are around the area never got coffee Right. So he wanted, we wanted to make a stop for coffee and he wanted to take, make a stop for, you know, to go buy something for his wife while he was there. And uh, we didn't stop for either. We did make one stop though in that four hour period. Right. And this is the most Russian thing ever. And I love this guy. So we went and just stopped randomly at a sporting goods shop and he went into the Adidas section to look for a jumpsuit. And I thought it was the most beautiful thing I have ever seen. Four hour walk. Didn't accomplish any of our goals, but at least he got to go check out the Adidas sweatsuit. sweatsuit. <laughs> I, I, was, I was dying laughing that night when you told me that. It's just but, so um, what, what I'm else? sorry, oh, Flex, man. I'm sorry if I'm making fun of you. I love you, man. You're great. Oh, no. I'm sure when, when I have him on, I'm sure he's going to have a, a snap roll story, you know? Oh, boy. Oh, 
the the other the other thing that we talked about a little bit at, at dinner that I want to ask. So another thing that I guess has molded your mind as far as like uh, free market, you know, principles and Austrian economics and regulation. You kind of dealt with the regulations in the arrow, you know, the the industry you were in before, and they kind of made you a little bit jaded as to how these these regulations actually play out in the in the market and what they cause. Yeah, well, they cause monopolies, is what they cause. But uh, yeah, what, are you are you getting at anything in particular? What do you? Yeah, like um, so if you could kind of talk about some of the regulations you saw in your previous industry and the unintended consequences that they might they caused. Um, I know you were talking about how they just. They don't even care about the FAA regulations and oh oh no I don't stuff. want to say they don't care about them they they absolutely care about them but the point that I want to right. make about yeah. most regulations is that yeah, a lot of them don't mean anything and it's because I don't know of an airline that that meets FAA regulations for safety I don't know of a single one I do know that all of them are way above FAA regulations because no insurance agency is going to insure an aircraft full of three hundred people if you are not like pretty awesome at your safety. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So it's right? almost so like there's uh, just like these fake walls all over the place. It's like a formality. So kind of, it's uh, maybe anti-competitive. I don't know. Right. Mm -hmm. So the FA, um, the intentions are good. Right. Every regulation has been written in blood for some reason or another. Okay. Right. Gotta, and by I mean, you know, over since like the 1910s, 1900s, and someone's probably died, and they said, okay, here's a regulation, blah 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 blah, but. But once everyone saw that that happened to the guy, no one did that again. It's almost like the regulation wasn't necessary. Right, right. I mean, it, it's um, they self-regulate in a sense. I mean, no, no airliner wants their plane to go down and lose, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in business. Well, I mean, look at it. Who's going to be more interested in the safety of that aircraft? Someone who has skin in the game, like an insurance company, or or someone who doesn't have a hundred million dollar asset on the line, like the FAA. I'm going to go with the insurance company. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so, much. so, yeah, there's that. And like I said, I, I know a lot of people, have, I, you know, I, I'm a flight instructor. I'm licensed and everything. I get it. There are – some of the stuff is, is pretty good, but the vast majority, I just – I don't really understand it, and it kind of holds back innovation. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah. So, oh, so the other thing I want to make, yeah, when I said monopolies, is if you look at any of the industries that are, that are highly regulated, you find monopoly practices. Right, so aviation. Name me another commercial aircraft builder in the U.S. Name me, name me five. I can name you yeah, one. Right. <laughs> I can name you one. It's Boeing. Mm -hmm. right? right. I can name you another one, but it's not in the U.S. It's called Airbus. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Um, so, so those are the majors. Same with defense. So how many defense companies do we have? Like four or five? Right. Yeah, yeah Boeing does it. Lockheed Martin. Um, uh, oh, man. It's, now you're getting me here. Halliburton. There's, <laughs> yeah, no, no, there, there's a, there's a few, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know why I'm not remembering them right now, but uh, but yeah, anywhere. And the same thing with uh, you know finance, right? So there was a bunch of banks before, and they've all kind of. Uh, how many investment banks are there in New York now? Big big investment banks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they gobbled Six, up a lot. Six, eight, ten, something like that. Right. Not a lot. Which is which is crazy to think about in such a giant uh, city. Right. So you, I mean, you tend to get a lot of. Um, Inefficiencies that come with that as well, but well, I, I've had this conversation with you know plenty plenty of people before when we get into the political regulation, you know the stand that standard conversation, and I'm like, you know, they, they talk about these laws against monopolies, um, which end up usually just creating a, a, right. they end up creating a monopoly, but and then they have to create more regulation to stop the monopoly that they create, <laughs> right? But <laughs> Absent, absent the regulation that creates a monopoly, if, say, there's a business that's an actual monopoly, all it really just means is that they are doing something way better than anybody else. Um, um, is this absent? Are you, are you okay? I'm absent saying, of regulation. Uh, yeah, I'm saying absent sure. something that actually keeps them at a competitive advantage from anybody else. Like, if it's a legitimate monopoly, it just means, you know, that you know how when they try to break up a company that's actually just doing something really well. Yeah, but well, so my point is, is how long do monopolies last in purely free market? Yeah, systems? it doesn't. It doesn't happen. I think um, I, I, it could, I but it's not going to last long because it's just going to be yeah. full of bureaucracy. Yeah, it's pretty much um, 
I, someone brought up one of the only ones they can think of, and they said De Beers. How true that is, I'm not sure. But uh, I can think of like De Beers and like Heinz ketchup. If you want to call that Monopoly, but that's about it. Well, that's because I'm not trying Hunt's, right? Heinz has got a great product. I'm not drink, <laughs> I'm not using Hunt's ketchup. Exactly. Like Heinz has a leg legitimate Monopoly, and right. they are they, awesome. they deserve the money. Now, Heinz is mustard. No. No. Yes, yeah. Heinz yeah. mustard. Not happening. <laughs> They need to get the Heinz. They need to get another team for the Heinz mustard. They need right. to work on it, but yeah, they can have um, the ketchup market though. <laughs> yeah, they, I I feel like sending them a Christmas card. That's how good they are. <laughs> <laughs> um. So yeah. Uh, Christian, what what else? Uh, I think we pretty much covered it. Um, we he uh, you you shared. Did you did you, was there anything else you wanted to share? Yeah, actually, last question that we typically ask, um, you know, most of our most of our guests. So, um, just a fun, you know, fun question you can get. Oh as, boy. As, well, no, it's uh, some people don't don't actually like this question because they want. It's like what everything. kind of ice cream topping I want to be or something. No, no, they want to yeah. keep it so they want to keep everything so realistic and not get into the future. I like to ask. And these are these are some things I like to talk about. What do you see on the horizon for ETC or blockchain in general? You can give, you know, wild use cases, whatever you think. Uh, although you're extremely pragmatic, so I'm sure you hate this question because you, you hate talking about mm -hmm. drones and all that stuff. <laughs> I don't hate it. I don't hate it. I could talk about it forever. It's just you're right, oh right, boy. Okay, so the the question is, is what's a, a wild use case that I can think of on this stuff? Yeah, what's your predictions. Um, your predictions for the future. Oh god, yeah. here we go. Um, what what is what does blockchain look like in uh, ten five, years? Five, five, years? Two, and, uh, good luck. And hook, hook it in. Hook it into um, your previous work with, uh, you know, flying and stuff like that. I don't know, man. That's a tough one. Once you reach, like, I think maybe the two year, two and a half year mark of being within this space. Okay, like, as far like, as you, can go. you start to like your dreams go away. You're like, <laughs> oh, we can't create world peace. That's yeah. not, you know, like it's that's way out there. Yeah. Okay. Right? So, so as far as your imagination goes. Um, for blockchain in general, for blockchain and tie it into aeros, you know, aerospace. Like what, 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 what tie excites it aerospace? You? Like what, what excites you, Snapro? Like one person, we yeah, guess that like internet. Sure, of sure. So what, it, was his what big excites thing. me is the fact that that somehow there is. A, I, I kind of go to Bitcoin on this one, but what excites me somehow is someone figured out how to make a unique digital asset. Mm -hmm. It's a unique item, right? That that's digital that hasn't existed any before and that's that's amazing and then that's when your imagination can just go crazy on what you know what the potential of this is what's interesting to me about etc is uh, just the fact that you can do some really low level programming some interesting stuff um i i think it's basic i don't know i don't know if you know what people think in terms of just doing all this um you know taking over stock markets and everything i don't know how long that is out that's kind of beyond my horizon. I kind of look at the next three years max. Mm -hmm. And right. so, so what I would like to see, what, what is interesting to me about this is, is kind of simple automations on what people currently do with Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. right. right. So, so simple stuff that people do can, can some of those small processes be, be automated? Do I have an example clear cut right now? No, because I wasn't expecting this question, but <laughs> in general, that's what interests me about ETC. So what I hear you saying, I think, is you're, you, you like the idea of making our lives uh, uh, easier or more efficient in the short term in, in different ways, more, uh, more efficient processes in, in uh, industry and other things using Bitcoin. Is A little cool? bit more pragmatic than that, but yes. I, well, okay, so in, in the crypto space, yes, making it easier, mostly eliminating even middlemen that are currently in the space. Mm -hmm. Right. So whether it's buying something yeah. online or or I don't know, some of the people that do gambling and stuff, I don't really do any of that. But but there's still middlemen in the space, even though we're trying to completely eliminate that because people are running their own websites for Bitcoin. Stuff like that. But can right. you eliminate that risk? And I think there is a, a pretty good use case for for something like ETC to remove a lot of this. A lot of that middleman. Mm -hmm. um, right. Um, risk i would say sure. so okay that, so, that, that is specifically what interests me how it'll so, play out no idea but that's kind of the that's kind of the case that i look at when i look at etc 
Okay, so so I'm I'm taking it that you're not seeing my use case for two yeah, unmanned yeah. two unmanned drones dropping off Amazon packages and crashing into each oh, other God. and executing a smart contract that Jesus. raises their insurance rates on the yeah. ETC network in the year 20XX. Not, I, not I mean, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm pragmatic to maybe a level where I'm just boring. I already knew that. Right. So, so yeah, I, I've, you got to remember I've gone through, so I used to be like that too, Carlo, when I had hope in life, but yeah, uh, <laughs> But keep in mind that late 2013 through 2015, I lived through the most insane hype cycle I've ever seen in my life when it came to drones. You put drone in a headline on a yeah. newspaper and you'd sell a newspaper, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. That was the craziest thing that everybody thought they were just going to do all this stuff. And when you, you sit back and you pull the emotion out and you look at what the use cases are, there are some interesting niche use cases. When I've been kind of working with NOAA, um, that's out in Boulder. Uh, that's yeah. the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. They do weather stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been kind of helping them out with some some interesting use cases. But uh, the same thing with this. It's it's really easy. And I I went through it too. I, maybe 2013, 2014. Yeah, my mind exploded, and I was like, the whole world is going to change. And you <laughs> drive up to Seattle from Portland to hang out with some people, and you look at all those bank buildings. You're like, they have no idea what's about to hit them, bro. And they don't. Yeah. But I don't think it's going to be just this massive rapid uptake where we have a billion people using this by next yeah. year. So, no, so you're not, you're right? cautiously optimistic. Uh, no, I'm, I'm not even cautiously optimistic. I'm optimistic. Uh -huh. I'm just not yeah. losing he, he my just, mind to emotion. He knows, right? he knows too much. He knows I too see. much. <laughs> I've, oh. I've seen things. Yeah, he's seen believe. things. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, so la last question. Um, this, I wanted to ask about this earlier. You mentioned telling people to get a 200 foot pole instead of with a camera on it, instead of the drone or something. Sure. Yeah. So there was, I was actually talking to a racetrack owner. Yeah. Um, now and, was uh, that, uh, was that, were you being facetious or this sounds like something you actually said? No. So the point is, is that the guy was like, Hey, I, I, what I'd like to do is track the cars going around the track. Right. So right. he goes, well, I want to take a drone and just put it up in the middle here. Can you help me out with that? Um, I think that, you know, that's, that's what I want to have as a drone right here. And I go, well, what is it that you want to do? Right. Well, I want to have a drone to fly up and do the, no, what is it that you want to do? I want, and you, you keep asking this, you drill down, you go, okay, you want to look at the, you know, the front three cars as they go around. So your little jumbotron thing. Um, this wasn't like a, this was like a NASCAR, like farming league. Right, you know right. how baseball's got the farming league. This was kind of right. one of those. And so you go, well, what is it that you actually want to do? And it's, I just want to keep the camera on the front three cars, you know, the front couple cars, so that people can see it, even when they're on the back stretch. Right. So um, you look at that and you go, well, is a drone needed? Is the drone the best use uh, for what you want? And then you can say, no. A, you've got something flying in the air. That's scary enough, right? You could have right. GPS issues, which causes the thing to fly off. Um, something could happen with the motors because most of these things are still using kind of RC components. There's nothing, there's no real like crazy Industrial. awesome. Yeah. yeah. So even, even a lot of the military guys are using RC equipment for certain things. I mean, right. they're all carbon fiber and all this stuff, but you know, a lot of them is like through Thomas or those. So, um, uh, so when you look at the cost and you look at the risk of raising a camera up via flying you know, quad or octocopter or something. And you say, okay, look, if you want to ensure this and not have a plan, not have this thing, you know, fly into a car or something, just put the same gimbaled camera. Heck, here's one that weighs 10 pounds more and can get you way better resolution. And we'll put it on this telescoping pole in the middle and it can rotate around without having to worry about the wires um, tangling up because it'll have a right. slip ring in there. And so you pretty much told them, get a 200 foot so pole. Yeah. Well, if that, if, yeah, if that it doesn't need to be 200, but yeah. So like a hundred, 200 foot pole, you could do that telescoping and have the camera on it. The point is, is what is he trying to do? Sure. Right. And then we figure out what the solution is. And 90% of the time it's not a drone, right? So right. the most use case that you have for drones right now are mostly novelty type stuff, like getting a cool picture somewhere. Okay. Right. Gotcha. But for like an industrial use case, it's not quite there yet. Gotcha, it'll, gotcha. it'll be there. Of course. It's just, 
just like a, you know, warp, warp drive will be here too, but I'm not going to invest in warp drive anytime soon. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, Christian, do you got anything else? Uh, no, I'm good. All right, um, guys. So uh, it was a pleasure. Yeah, thanks for thank joining you. us tonight, uh, everybody out there listening. Thank you guys for listening, and uh, we'll see you guys uh, next week. Take care. All right, take care, guys. Bye, Christian.